enough to mm-hmm. pay all the bills that we have. I'm at the point where I could lose my house. How are people supposed to do this? How are people supposed to survive? The richer are getting richer and the middle class is getting poorer. So many of the headlines these days seem to be about income inequality. A huge gap in this country between the middle class and the richest people. The wealthiest 1% of Americans. Get America ready to dig a little income deeper income into your wallet. This- From 1979 to 2007, the income of the top 1% increased by 2%. 275%. For the rest of us, it was just 29%. But the real problem is that as prices of everyday household items go up, many people can't even afford the things that they need to live. Finances are a big issue. How do I pay for groceries? Gas is $4 a gallon. The price of bananas has gone up. The price of apples, bread. We're still making less, but the prices of everything are skyrocketing. I try to refinance my home so I can keep my house. And I was told I I didn't make enough money. The place where middle class people's wealth resides, their home, continuing to fall, while the place where the wealth for the top resides, which is in the stock market, hard assets, the global economy, the ability to invest internationally, that's all been booming. How can you not make enough money? If you're earning an average American salary, you can pay for just 10 months of health insurance, 5 months of college tuition, and buy 10% of an average American home. But if you're an average Fortune 500 CEO, one year's salary can pay for your health insurance for the next 300 years, your kid's college tuition for 200 years, plus buy 34 and a half new homes. The forces that have created income inequality, I think, are so powerful and long-lasting that it's not like someone can turn a switch or pass a law and make it all go away or even reverse the trend. These are very powerful forces. The rich are going to be rich. You want to fix that? Get rid of the loopholes. Fix the tax code. I even went down to the Occupy Wall Street thing last week just to see, does our country have the guts to, to go through the change that it's going to require to have change? On the street, it had the look and feel of a war zone. Police firing stun grenades, beanbag projectiles and rubber bullets, tear gas flying. From the air, panic. The crowd seen here dispersing in seconds, running for cover. All the result of a day-long encroachment by police who moved in in the early morning, dismantling the protesters' tent city. But the protesters returned, trying to take back the plaza that had been theirs for more than two weeks. Taking away people's right to peacefully assemble in this country, you know, this is really outrageous. Also overnight, arrests in Atlanta with protesters defying orders to vacate a city park. This scene ended peacefully, but in Oakland. Hi, Evan Montes of Call Throne here, and how about this whole Occupy Movement thing going on in the States right now? I mean, I've never seen anything like it, especially in the States, you know? I mean, this is the country of life, liberty, and happiness. And that's certainly how I remember it growing up there, I mean. But that was in the 70s. Okay, so let's fast forward to 2011. What do we have? We have America on the brink of social and economical collapse. Or am I just exaggerating? Maybe these are just tough times and things will pick up again next year? It could be, right? But what if it's not? What if this is something far, far worse? What if it's the beginning of the end for America? Here's the thing. If you know me through my videos, you know that I believe America is prophesied in the Bible as being condemned to destruction, literally. So you, you can check out my channel, especially the Mystery Babylon uh, video for more details. And in this video, I want to share some additional things about this belief I have. And you are free to critique this any way you wish. So here goes. Now, I've been waiting to see civil unrest in the U.S. for a few years now because of uh, this man. His name is Dumitru Duduman, and he claims God gave him a prophecy about America. Now, I have no idea if this guy is genuinely a prophet, so I'm definitely not promoting him as anything. But I'm not saying he's false or his testimony is false. All I'm saying is that I was intrigued when I heard his testimony, which includes uh, visions of the end of the United States. 
and he gives a sign and it goes something like in the middle of the country people are going to start fighting the government and the go government's going to be busy with you know all these riots and unrest from their own population and in that moment they're going to be attacked from a coalition of foreign nations so that's something that's stuck in my head for f of some years now and now in this year 2011 we're practically starting to see um, social unrest across the nation and it seems to be growing I don't know so maybe it's nothing maybe it's just gonna go away in a few weeks or maybe it's gonna get worse but I can't help but wonder if this Occupy movement and all the protests happening right now are validating in any way this, this so-called prophecy of Mr. Dudemann. But let's go out on a limb here and say for argument's sake that it is. And that would mean the time has come for America. Now I could just leave it at that, at a 50-50 possibility of this event giving some type of validation to Dimitru's prophecy. But there are some other elements that can be added into this and this time they come from sources a lot closer to me and easier to verify. I'm talking about myself. Now am I saying I'm a prophet? Absolutely not. I am not a prophet. However, as your average Christian, I do receive dreams and visions from time to time from God, as all Christians do or should. And of these dreams and visions, there's three in particular that, you know, that I'd like to share, two of them being very recent, and for that reason, I'm quite worried about it. So here goes. The first one I'm gonna share is from September of 2010. Um, in this dream I had, I dreamt that I was with my wife and family in the United States uh, in somebody's house in a nice suburban neighborhood. And outside, a storm began to form. Really dark clouds began uh, covering the sky and there were high winds. I went outside with my wife and suddenly a funnel started forming from the clouds and coming down. Only it wasn't going towards the ground but towards my wife. And immediately I started to uh, fight it off or reprimand it in the name of Jesus. And as I did, the funnel started to back away. While I was doing this, I noticed some of my family members from inside the house looking at us. Like I, I could hear their thoughts. They were like thinking like, poor Christians. They think a typical storm is, a, is an act of God. But anyhow, the storm started to get worse and everybody left the house and we all started looking for shelter and trees started falling down. The funny thing about this uh, dream is that the shelter we ended up taking as shelter was a Chili's restaurant and we entered and the place was just jam-packed. So I don't get that part. Just like I don't have the gift of prophecy, I don't have the gift of dream interpretation. But here are my thoughts, my personal thoughts anyhow, about what this could mean. The dark clouds definitely symbolize the day of the Lord which means judgment day, which means destruction, hence the tornadoes that were forming. To understand this a little bit better, I have a video called Asparatus Clouds, where you can see what I'm talking about in reference to clouds symbolizing the day of the Lord. I believe that the funnel that was heading straight towards my wife and that I was able to make retreat using the name of Jesus was a reminder that as my wife's husband, by default, I become her head as man is the head of his wife and whatever family they form together. This means, by default, her protection from destruction depends on me, on my actions. The head of the family determines protection or destruction for those who are under him, the wife, the kids, etc. This is biblical. We see this in the Bible all the time. For those who practice righteousness, there is protection for him and all the household. We see this in the case of Noah, whose righteousness provided coverage for his wife and his children and their wives, all who got a free ticket on the ark because of a single person, Noah. Or we see the case with Lot, whose entire family was saved from the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. But in the same way that one man's action determines protection for his family, his actions can also determine destruction for his family. We see that in the case of Akan in Joshua chapter 7, who because of his sin, his entire family was destroyed. Or Job even, when God temporarily lifted the protection from him, the first thing that happened was all his kids died. So I personally believe that my action of uh, fighting off the, the tornado in the name of Jesus to protect my wife is God telling me, hey, remember, you are the head, 
be responsible, be obedient, so that I can protect her through you. And if something happens to her because of your disobedience, you're the one who's going to respond to me of what happened to her. So it's a reminder and it's a warning. Men, we have a very serious responsibility as the head of the household. I talk about this in a little bit more detail in my video, The Nonlinearity of God. The part where my family is looking out the window thinking, poor Christians, poor fanatical Christians, probably has to do with the fact that in real life, I am the only born again believer of the family. And currently my family doesn't take it too seriously. They just think it's some kind of new Sunday religion that I have, and it's no big deal. The next dream I had uh, took place a couple of weeks ago, October 15th, 2011. In this dream, I only, I only remember certain parts, but basically I was traveling to the United States. I arrived at the airport and the airport was flooded, maybe up to the waistline. I went to baggage pickup or baggage claim and the bags were coming out, all of them underwater. And I remember I claimed my bag that had my laptop computer in it and it was completely soaked. At the airport, my brother-in-law picked me up. So we were in his car driving to his house. Somebody else was in the car with us, I don't know who. And I remember that in the car driving down the road, to the left there was a big open field, a crop field. But the field was completely empty, completely depleted, except for one single wheat bundle that was in the middle, smack in the middle, and the color of the wheat was very golden, quite nice looking, but it was the only bundle there. It was a tied bundle in the middle of a depleted field. The floodwaters, I think, is pretty obvious. It speaks of troubles or disasters, and the fact that it was at the international airport when I was arriving, I think, means that uh, troubles are arriving to America or have arrived to America. As for my brother-in-law picking me up, I really don't know what that symbolizes. One thing that is unique about my brother-in-law is, is that he probably listens to me with the most interest. I have some family members who show some interest in my faith when I talk to them about it or show my videos to them, but my brother-in-law probably shows more interest than anybody else when I speak about these things. So there might be some connection there or some reason there for him being in my dream. The empty crop field with that single bundle of wheat in the middle reminds me a lot of how wheat is used throughout the Bible to symbolize the righteous believers. Jesus used the wheat symbology in some of his parables about how there's going to come a time when he's going to harvest his field. He's going to gather the good wheat and the bad tars. He's going to throw the tars in the fire, but he's going to store the wheat in the barn. And the fact that there's only one bundle left, I believe, is saying the time of the harvest is here. He, he's, he's, al he's already collecting. There's one bundle left left to gather and that's it. So we are at the 11th hour basically. Again, this is talking about Judgment Day. And the last dream I remember having was like five days later, October 20th, 2011. This was probably the most vivid dream of all of them. In this dream, I was now in the apartment of my brother-in-law and my sister. It was a condominium in Florida on a really high floor, like 20 and above. And I was just in the apartment, you know, just hanging out. And I had my camera in my hand because I was looking for things to record. And I looked out the window of the balcony and there was these huge, immense clouds. These were like asparatus clouds. These definitely were asparatus clouds. They were absolutely enormous and they were right in front of the apartment. I went out to the balcony and my brother-in-law and my sister were sitting there and I got mad at them. I say, why didn't you call me? I, I want to film this. I need to film this. But they just sat there without saying anything. And anyway, so I looked at the clouds and they were like, they were right in front of me. They were so detailed. And, and so intense. It was the, the dream was really vivid. And again, there were funnels that were trying to, to touch the ground, to, to form and touch down. And there was like two or three at a time that would, that would start going down, but for some reason they would retract and go back up. They never made it all the way down. But the funnels were so scary. And I was thinking, wow, if one of these touches down, it's gonna destroy everything. And I was looking at this and it was right in front of the apartment. It's like I could reach out and I could touch one of these funnels. So they were very intense. It was very intimidating. 
and it completely filled and took up the entire sky. So I started filming and I started like narrating what was happening, like if I was a news reporter. But from one moment to the other, the, the clouds engulfed us. The clouds covered us completely and we could not see anything at all. It wasn't darkness, but it was like, you know, you can't see anything because of the fog. You couldn't see your hand in front of your face. And I was narrating the whole thing. And I, and I was saying, this is probably what happened in Egypt when God brought darkness upon the land. So there's definitely a pattern here with my brother-in-law. In the first dream, he's picking me up at the airport when I arrived to the United States. And now in this second dream, I'm at his house staying there while visiting the United States. What can that mean? I don't know. Maybe I'm supposed to warn my family about what's going to happen and it's through him that I have to do it since he's the one who listens the most. And I don't live in the United States while he does and so does my family. And I believe that since he and my sister were just sitting at the balcony looking at all these things happening and not doing anything, not saying anything, just show how they being unbelievers or unbelievers in general are seeing the signs happening and they're not paying attention. They're not taking it seriously. They don't consider it to be anything out of the ordinary, anything apocalyptic. Uh, me with my camera, I think that's just me wanting to put videos on YouTube. Now the difference between the, the clouds and the tornadoes is that the clouds are a sign, but the tornadoes are the real deal. The clouds are a sign, they're, they're a warning, they're warning us of something, but tornadoes are now the actual destruction. So we see that there are tornadoes that were starting to form, trying to form, but not yet quite there. Almost, but not quite. So all the signs are right there in front of us. And we have like the very last minutes to, to make a decision and do something and prepare. Otherwise, we're gonna be engulfed in tribulation. God is warning us. He always warns everybody about what he's gonna do. That's biblical. But if people are not paying attention, so be it. Okay, so that's basically what I wanted to share with you guys. Just my dreams that I've had, thoughts I've had about, you know, those dreams and other elements and of the rioting and happening in the United States and how I believe it's probably connected and it's probably God-given. Now, again, I do not guarantee that any of this is from God. It could be just dreams of my own imagination coupled with the testimony of a false prophet coupled with protests that have nothing to do with end-day events. Maybe there's nothing of God in any of this. But on the other hand, maybe all of this is from God. All of this is uh, warnings and apocalyptic events. So I can't guarantee it because I myself do not know, but I do believe. You are free to judge this however you wish. If you don't believe, that's fine. But if you do believe, or if you think that there's a good possibility that this is from God, then you might be asking yourself, or you might be wondering, what about those of us who live in the United States? What about those of us who want to repent? Uh, those of us who want to be saved? Those of us who don't want to be in the destruction? Those of us who want to heed God's warnings? What do we do? Okay, in that case, I would want to talk about another so-called prophecy from another so-called prophet. Again, that I do not have any confirmation or guarantee that it is factual or God-given, but it is interesting, and so I will share it with you. When there's judgment and destruction, God offers a plan of protection for those who want to listen and be obedient. An escape route, so to say. This is evident throughout the Bible, whether it was saving people from the angel of death in Egypt or from the Great Flood, from Sodom and Gomorrah, the Babylonian invasion, etc. God always has a plan for salvation. But the only way to find this escape route is to listen carefully. And the way to listen carefully is to put aside what we think is going to happen. In other words, church doctrines, prophecy theories, prophecy books and movies, mindsets, paradigms, etc., etc. Now many Christians think that God will automatically place them inside a protective bubble when disaster strikes. That all they need to have is faith in Him and no more. Well, faith without works renders it useless. So it's the work, the getting up and moving that we need to be informed about and ready to do. Even God's own son, Jesus, had to get up and go to Egypt for salvation back when Herod the Great began murdering all the children of two years and under. Mary and Joseph had to leave their entire lives behind and move to a foreign land. So God's plan of protection isn't necessarily comfortable or easy. 
but it's available if you understand it and act upon it. As for the destruction of America, well, there's a testimony of a man named A.C. Valdez who claims to have received a vision back in 1929 showing great destruction on the U.S. However, he was also shown in the spirit um, a place with many hills, rolling hills, and in the midst of these hills there was a great multitude dressed in white. Now this was still within the United States apparently, but it was a place of protection, far away from the destruction. And he claims he then heard the voice of God say, This is my beloved, I care for my own. This vision was of the Church of God having traveled far into a place where he ordered them to go to escape the destruction. And just like the Israelis in the wilderness, God was providing everything they needed, especially protection. Now I personally believe in this vision, and if you do too, and you live in the US, then you need to place close attention to what God is saying or gonna say. There's a proper way to do this, otherwise you're gonna believe that your own thoughts or feelings or paradigms or doctrines that you believe in are the information that God is giving. But you have to set all that aside and do this properly. You can start by visiting this website, thehillgodcallstheplace.net, and please take time to read the site. All preparation requires great effort. This situation is definitely not the exception. So thank you for watching and God bless you.